الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله We get this question a lot um, What about the madhahib? How did they come to be Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanbali, Zahiri? What madhab should I follow? Uh, why do we have madhahib? What were there before the madhahib? What madhab did the Sahaba follow? Do I have to follow the madhab of my country? Uh, I get a lot of these questions. So I'm going to make this video. And uh, I've written up some of the stuff here. Oh, yeah. A guest, apparently. But anyway, um, the point of this is not the geographical uh, studies. It's just to kind of give you a, a background and an understanding of where things were and how things developed, inshallah ta'ala. So don't get too caught up on the map. Just use it as a guide. Listen to what I'm saying and use this for benefit, inshallah ta'ala. Tayyib, alhamdulillah wa salatu salam ala rasulillah. Awalan, the first thing we have to understand is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was born 53 years qabl al-hijri, before the migration from Mecca to Medina. And he died around 11 Hijri. So during this time, 53 Qabl al-Hijri to 11 Hijri, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was on this earth. When he was around 40 years of age, the prophethood began, the Quran was revealed to him. And from then till around 63 years of age, he was given this Nabuwa over 23 years about of the life of the Prophet Wasallam. There was the prophethood time, which in that time, the people that were Muslims, when they had a question, what would they do? They would go to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and they would say, Oh Messenger of Allah, uh, this, this, this is going on. What is the answer? And he, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would give them the answer. And that would be it. You didn't need madahib, you didn't need fiqh, you didn't need usul al-fiqh, you didn't need checking of hadith, <laughs> because you could just walk up to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and ask him a question, and you know he said it because you directly heard it. Great time. Those that were believers in that time are the Sahaba, they were blessed, they were honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Okay, now what happens is uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he passes away from this worldly life, he dies um, and the time of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, the great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he was now the Khalifa, he was the leader of the Muslims and where was this? This was in Medina, here. So Mecca is where the Prophet ﷺ began with prophethood. When he made the Hijrah, when he made the migration, they were in Medina. This area is called Hijaz. This area, and the way I have the map here, what I've done in this lighter green, which you might not be able to see too well, I've put the current day country names. The outline of the map is in this different type of green. In this blue with the two lines underneath, I've written the old names. So this used to be called Al Jazeera Al Arab. Al Jazeera Al Arab is the Arabian Peninsula. Today it's called this area, it's called Saudi Arabia. Here's Yemen, Oman, Qatar, the Gulf countries, Kuwait, Bahrain, all of that over here. You have Egypt here, you have Palestine currently occupied, may Allah free it. And then you have Syria, um, you have Lebanon, Jordan. This was all called Al Sham. This is Al Sham, this is Jazeera Al Arab. This is Iraq. This area was all called Iraq. This area was called Faras. This is what is part of that will be current day Iran. This area, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, the northern areas of Pakistan, this was all called Khurasan. This was originally called Khurasan. So there is Khurasan, there is Faras, there is Iraq, there is Jirit al Arab, there is Sham. Out of all of this, now at this time, Islam is only in this area. The Muslims are only in this area. So here you have Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Now you have Muslims on this side where it's called Yamama, not Yemen, but Yamama and other areas, but they're again only in the Arabian Peninsula. And if they have a question, if they have a dispute, if they have a disagreement, what do they do? They go to the companions. The companions of the Prophet وسلم, are alive at that time. And the Khalifa, the center, is Abu Bakr radiyallahu So the final say would be that of the Khalifa, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu from 11 Hijri to around 13 Hijri, short time was his Khilafa until yani he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted that he left his dunya, he died as well, 
And now Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu was the Khalifa. Umar ibn Khattab was the Khalifa from 13 Hijri, picking up from the death of Abu Bakr radiallahu to the 23rd Hijri year, right? Now these 10 years around, Umar radiallahu is the Khalifa. Again, he is in Medina, but Muslims are in Sham, in these areas, they're advancing towards Al-Iraq, they're winning victories. And you have the companions, you have Khalid bin Walid, you have uh, Anas ibn Malik, you have uh, uh, Ibn Mas'ud, Ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar. These companions are Fuqaha, you have Mu'ad ibn Jabal, they're going to different areas. So if somebody has a question, what do they do? They ask the companions. If there is a disagreement, they take it back to Umar ibn Khattab. So at this time again, there is no need for Madahib, there is no need for Usul al-Fiqh. But at this time, Umar Radiyan is already checking narration. If somebody says that the Prophet ﷺ said something, he would ask them, bring witnesses, make sure to check. So he's verifying that knowledge, but he is that final authority. And that is beautiful. You go back to Umar ibn Khattab. He was a memorizer of the Quran. He was a faqih. He was a, a, a fiqh a scholar. He was a scholar in, in um, yani, all of the sciences of Islam. He was able to read and write and so on. So you would go to him. When Umar Radiyan was made shaheed, um, after that, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, the great companion, the one who was married to the two daughters of the Prophet وسلم, obviously at different times, Dhul Nurain, he is the Khalifa from 23rd Hijri to 35 Hijri. Now Islam has spread to parts of Egypt, parts of what is Sham today. Uh, those parts would, some of those even would be in Turkey, current day Turkey, but Syria and these areas, obviously advances have been made into Iraq, um, all the way into the areas where is Faras and then areas of Yemen and Oman and all these areas, Alhamdulillah. As these advances are being made, there are Sahaba, companions of the Prophet Sallallahu like Ibn Mas'ud, who's in Kufa, like Ibn Abbas, who's in Baghdad for a while. He traveled to different areas as well, like Mu'ad Ibn Jabal, like Bilal uh, radiallahu anhu, who was in Dimashq and so on, uh, Amr ibn As, who was in Egypt. So these Sahaba would answer questions. People had questions, new situations would come up. You know, uh, somebody gave a divorce in a particular manner. Somebody uh, asks about a particular type of meat, like hyena meat or something that wasn't common at the time or elephant meat. And when the Quran would be consulted, first and foremost, obviously, and if the answer was not there in the Quran, explicitly obviously the main hukam is going, main ruling is going to be there they would go to the companion and say do you know from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam a ruling meaning a hadith about this issue and many narrations we mentioned where they would the sahaba would tell uh, each other they would remind each other because no one sahabi knew every hadith right for example ali bin abi talib radiyanhu he saw those people who were cursing Uthman radiyanhu, that were causing problems and so on. They were, they were, they were uh, going too far in their ghulu for Ali radiyanhu. He lit them on fire. But then Abdullah ibn Abbas, the uncle, uh, yani the cousin of the Prophet وسلم, the son of the uncle of the Prophet وسلم, the, the, the relative also of Ali radiyanhu, the great Sahabi, the one that Rasulullah sallallahu said made dua, the oh Allah give him the understanding of the wahi. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he told Ali radiyanhu, that don't you know that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa forbid punishing with fire? That only the rub of the fire, Allah can punish with fire. Hayatin al-Bukhari. Ali radiyan didn't know the ruling. In Fath al-Bari, Ibn Hajar mentions that Ali radiyan told him, if I knew the ruling, if I had heard this from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa I wouldn't have done it. Just like Abu Bakr radiyan, he mentioned the hadith about the time of the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa about burying prophets where they die. Other companions didn't know that hadith. Aisha radiyan, many times, she mentioned a hadith that other Sahaba didn't know. Many Sahaba would go to verify a hadith with Aisha radiyan, because she knew much knowledge other Sahaba didn't know. She had that close companionship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So, the Sahaba, they would remind each other. Umar Radiyan would remind uh, Abu Musa al-Ashari, for example, and other narrations that are there. So, in this time, again, Uthman ibn Affan Radiyan's time, you would continue to go back to the Khalifa. He is the Khalifa. He is the final authority. Now, you have the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Radiyallahu Anhu, the great Khalifa, Amir al uh, the son-in-law of the Prophet Sallallahu as well as Uthman Radiyan, who was the husband of Fatima Radiyallahu Anha and also يعني, uh, the nephew of the Prophet وسلم, or the cousin actually. So now you have Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu. 
he is now the Khalifa 35 to 40 Hijri at this time now what happens if you are in the area that Ali Radian is there you would definitely take the questions to him then you have a split amongst the Sahaba and so on you have the time of Muawiyah Radianhu and Ali Radianhu and then you have after that Hassan and Hussein and uh, the great uh, grand uh, grandchildren other companions and they all uh, Zubair for example he was in Al-Makkah and they would have areas where these Sahaba would be and they would be the Fuqaha they would be the scholars that you would go to with questions now here some of the Sahaba would consult each other some of them would make ishtihad they would make judgments based on the Quran and Hadith and what they knew but they were still the final authorities all the way to Anas ibn Malik Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu is the last of the major well-known Sahaba that were alive so when he died in 93 Hijri and subhanallah he had a long life from 10 qabl al Hijri from 10 before Hijri to 93 Hijri he was alive so when he died in 93 Hijri the major Sahaba now have passed away so you had Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in Kufa, you had Ibn Abbas in, in Baghdad for a while, you had other Sahaba as well, Ali ibn Abi Talib Radian, for example, and you had uh, Bilal Radian, for, uh, for example, in Damascus, and you had uh, Abdullah ibn Umar in Medina, you had Zubair ibn Awam in Mecca, you had Abdullah, uh, his son as well, and so on, and you had Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Al As, you had Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Al Khattab, you had these Sahaba. Uh, in these these uh, different areas so the scholars of those areas would take knowledge from them but like I said not every Sahabi knew every hadith and we've shown the Sahaba went to different different areas they were geographically spread apart going out there fighting jihad qital spreading uh, any Islam and fighting to defend the borders against enemies and so on so those that knowledge was now spread out throughout the Muslim Ummah at this time now, now the time of the companions is over. Now, questions are still coming up. People have questions. People say, hey, you know, uh, this particular thing happened in wudu. What should we do? Uh, we heard a narration from a particular Sahabi saying, do it this way. And we heard from another Sahabi saying it this way. Which way should we do it? So when these questions came up, the great scholars of Islam started to develop methods to answer those questions and this is very important to understand none of the famous madahib started out in trying to make a madhab it's not like they were like I'm gonna start my own dojo and I'm gonna have my students this is not the way it is everybody wanted to find out what is the sunnah what is the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so in trying to do so they said okay everybody agreed that the Quran is the final authority so if something is clear in the Quran Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says aqimu salah establish the salah no madhab no alim no imam no faqih is going to be like eh, should we establish salah or not obviously we establish salah Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala made uh, alcohol haram in the Quran they agree alcohol is haram Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala established that you should pay zakat in the Quran they agree Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala established all of these different rulings no doubt to that but now the issue gets to be okay no doubt we have to pray but I'm a traveler do I pray two or four well I mean these great scholars they saw in the Quran it doesn't mention two rak'ah or four rak'ah it just mentioned establish the salah so they went to the sunnah they went to the ahadith and they saw so many ahadith clearly mention that you make four when you're muqeem when you're a resident and two when you're a traveler okay they agreed no problem to that all of the four madahib agreed that the best way is for the muqeem to make four and for the traveler to make two now the question gets to be let's say you're traveling can you combine prayers or not so then they said okay we go back to the hadith of the prophet ﷺ. did he combine did he not combine now during these types of discussions and these types of questions and again, these are few differences in the, in, in, in the belief, in the creed, in the aqidah. All of the Sahaba, they were athari, they followed the athar, they followed the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa They followed the Quran, they followed the narrations. They said, this is what Allah said, this is what the Rasul said, this is what we stop at. This was the right aqidah. All of the four aima as well, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad. Uh, we'll talk about them inshallah. But they were people of the correct aqidah. They followed the same belief. 
None of them were Ashari, none of them Maturudi, none of them were Mu'tazili, none of them were Mutakallimeen. They did not believe in Ilmul Kalam and philosophy and all these kinds of things that developed later. And it's not that that name, some people say, oh, that's because that wasn't there in their time. No, it was. In fact, these types of deviances in creed were there in that time and they were the first to condemn them. And you can find many narrations where they would condemn the people of uh, Kalam, yani philosophy and things. Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad, you can find all of them condemned this type of a deviance in creed. So in creed, in belief, in aqidah, they were all together. But in fiqh issues, in day-to-day -day fatwa, like giving verdicts, now they had to come up with a way to understand. Because one thing is from the Qur'an, okay, we all agree. One thing clear from the Prophet ﷺ, we all agree. But what if you have a difference between some of the companions? What if you have a weak hadith uh, that is not extremely weak, right? And now, many of the hadith are not even uh, yani collected in a central location because we mentioned some of the Sahaba were all the way in Khurasan, some of the Sahaba were in Al Iraq, some were in Sham, some were in Misr, in Egypt, some were still in Hijaz, some were in other parts of Jazirat al Arab, some were in Faras, some were out there. Uh, yani we have the graves of Sahaba in Afghanistan and northern areas of Pakistan and so on. So that means a lot of that knowledge had spread throughout the Ummah and now there was a need to collect it together as well. So you had two major schools developed now, right? One was around Al Madina. And Al Madina was a center of knowledge, it was a center of learning. Why? Because this is where the Khilafah was. Originally, we see that in the time of the Prophet, ﷺ, in the time of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali, radiallahu anhum, in the earlier times, it was there. In the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib, anhu, he moved his center out towards Baghdad, towards Iraq, and Muawiyah was around Damascus in Syria. But before that, this was centralized. So the majority of the Sahaba were here, and the Fuqaha, I mean the great people of Fiqh, like the Fuqaha Sab'a, the seven great Fuqaha of Medina, were well known for having a lot of knowledge. So here in Medina, you had the great scholars like Nafi'a, you had Az Zuhri, and they developed a school called the Ahlul Hadith, the people of Hadith. And they focused a lot on hadith. And one of the students of Zuhri and one of the students of Nafi'ah, one of the great scholars, Imam Malik. I'm going to add this here, inshallah, if my cat allows me to get past her. Uh, you have Al Imam Malik. Imam Malik. He was in Medina. Okay. Imam Malik. He was uh, born 93 Hijri, if I'm not mistaken. And he died in 179 Hijri. So you have 93 through 179 Hijri, which tells you that he was born right towards the end, in fact, the same year that Anas ibn Malik Radyan died. So now you have this next generation. This is not the generation that is the generation of the Sahaba, but it's the next generation after him. Right? So you have him in Medina and he heads up. And again, he's not the first one that came up with, obviously. The Ahlul Hadith have always been there because they were the people who followed Hadith. But he is the one that becomes the prominent scholar of this school. Now, in Kufa, on the other hand, you have many a great scholars like Ibrahim and Nakha'i and others who are there and they want to focus on developing knowledge as well. The people of Medina, they had uh, a lot of scholars, they had uh, people who saw the Prophet ﷺ right before his death. So the idea here was, okay, if we have something in the Quran, obviously it's there. We look at the Ahadith, yes. If not, Imam Malik and his madhab focused and they said, okay, if we have a disagreement, we really need to look at the Amal of Ahlul Madinah, the actions of the people of Medina, because they are the last ones to see the Prophet ﷺ. This is where the majority of the Sahaba were and so on. So we give precedence to that. Now here in Kufa, you have great Sahaba like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and others that were out there. Ibn Abbas was there for as well as well and so on. But they couldn't go to Medina and check for the people of Medina every time they have a question. 
So they, they also agreed, if you have in the Quran, we agree. If it's authentic from the Prophet ﷺ, we agree. But if not, then we need to use our deductive reasoning, Rai, our opinions, and have a consultation between different scholars to throw around ideas and find out what we should do. So for this, they developed a madhab, a methodology as well, in Kufa. And this is going to be famously headed by Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Abu Hanifa is very early. He is born 80 Hijri. So, 80 Hijri. And he dies, he passes away 150 Hijri. So you have Imam Abu Hanifa, very early scholar. I, I mean, E.D. Hijri tells you that he's even earlier than Imam uh, Malik. Now, Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi started to study later in his life. Imam Malik started earlier. So they were very, con I mean, their knowledge-wise, they were very close together. They were contemporaries. Um, he lived to 150 Hijri. Again, this is towards the end of the era of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum. As a child, he saw some of the Sahaba, like Anas ibn Malik, um, but he didn't study directly from them. We don't have a single chain where he reports a hadith, for example, directly from a Sahabi. But he did see some of the Sahaba as a child, and he studied from some of the great students of the Sahaba, like Shu'ba and others who were scholars uh, at the time. So he took the, yani, the Kufan school, which was called Ashab al-Rai, the people of opinion or deduction. And he said, okay, look, if we have it in the Quran, of course we agree. If we have a Sahih Hadith, we agree. But if not, then we're going to use our logical deduction and so on. Both wanted to know the Sunnah. Both agreed that when you have the Sahih Hadith, that is our Madhab. That is what we should follow. Okay? Now, Abu Hanifa, he has students. And his students are very interesting because they are not even called his students, they are called his companions. Ashab, his companions. For example, Qadi Abu Yusuf, Imam Qadi, the great scholar Abu Yusuf, and Imam Muhammad al Shaybani. These are the two famous companions. Even though they are students of Abu Hanifa, they are called companions. Why? Because he dealt with them in a way that was like uh, contemporaries. They would discuss, they would debate, they would uh, argue with each other, they would have go back and forth, and many a times, in many masail, Abu Hanifa would make ruju'ah. He would, he would turn to the opinion of his students, and that shows his humbleness. But it also shows that they were not staunch on these things. Like today, many people that follow the madahib, they make it as if it's a religion. Like if it's in the Hanafi madhab, it's as if it's in the Quran, and they will find, uh, or Shafi'i, or Maliki, or Hanbali, and so on and they will find any which way to justify it and they will not care about any evidences is this if this is the madhab then the, you know this like a gang as if you're like tattooed up with it or something that's not the way the great scholars took it that's why we love all of them because they were trying to do the right thing they were trying to find the right opinion based on their abilities and what was available to them now again i haven't even talked about any of the great scholars of hadith yet and we will inshallah because uh, meaning, other than Imam Malik, obviously, he was a scholar who wrote uh, one of the early books. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But like the Bukharis and the Muslims and Abu Dawud and Al-Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, and Nisa'i and all those great uh, Imam Ahmad and others, they're not even in the picture yet. That means all of those travels of them going to Yemen and them going uh, يعني, to parts of Khurasan and Sham and collecting a hadith and bringing them together, that work hasn't even taken place yet. So many of the ahadiths from the Sahaba that were in Sham or that were in Misr, they would not reach Kufa. Imam Malik famously did not want to leave Medina. I mean, can't blame him. It's Medina to Nabi. It's the, it's the city of the Prophet Sallallahu who wants to leave Medina to Nabi. Only time he left Medina was to go for Hajj to Mecca. That's it. He never traveled to collect hadith. He said he loved the, 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 the city of the Prophet Sallallahu that much. He never wanted to leave. So that means... The access he had was to the ahadith that the people of Medina knew. So those ahadith that maybe the people of Kufa and Baghdad and those, some of them would have reached him from people traveling and going to Medina. For example, when they're visiting the grave of the Prophet ﷺ or the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ and so on. But some of those ahadith may not reach Medina. So again, he's working on what is available to him. Now, at this time, 
you have these two great scholars with these two madhahib, these two schools of thought. Imam Malik here writes a very valuable work. It's called the Muatta of Imam Malik, very famous. And then the student of Abu Hanifa, Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani, he writes kind of like a, 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 a denman to it. He, he studies it and then he adds his own ahadith that he has collected to it and so on. So these scholars are also working on collecting ahadith. They're doing an amazing work for the ummah. Imam Malik has already now written something that is still within our hands. It's, it's, you know, I have it in one volume in Arabic. I have a two volume Arabic English translation. Uh, of the Muatta Imam Malik. He had already started collecting and in it he would mention the ahadith that would be evidences for what he followed. And if the people of Medina did something opposite to the hadith then he, then he would say that these ahadith have been reported and these had been reported but these ones are what the people of Medina acted in accordance to and he would mention that in his Muatta. Imam Abu Hanifa we don't have a book that we can authentically say he wrote. There are books like Fiqh al-Akbar and Fiqh al-Awsat that are Aqidah books that are attributed to him. And then there is the Musnad Abu Hanifa, but uh, I think it's pretty much agreed upon that this was mostly collected by his student students and then given his name and so on. But he is developing Fiqh. He is what they called him the father of Fiqh. He is developing those usul, those principles on how to derive Fiqh and so on. Now comes another scholar who was born in Palestine in Gaza. He was born in Gaza, but he was, and he, he traveled a lot for seeking knowledge, including he, he went to Medina, and he was a student of Imam Malik directly. He memorized the Muatta Imam Malik, he studied with Imam Malik, he spent a lot of time with Imam Malik, and he went and studied from many of the students of Abu Hanifa. He went to Iraq, to these areas, and in Baghdad, he became famous there, and he is a Shafi'i, Sheikh uh, Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i. So this is now in these areas you have al-Shafi'i. Tayyib. Imam Muhammad Idris al-Shafi'i, he was born, now we're getting to a little bit of the later time, 150 Hijri and he died in 204 Hijri. So now what do you have? You have somebody who is uh, yani one of the only ones that's actually from Ahlul Bayt, as the scholars have mentioned. You can look Munaqib al-Shafi'i uh, by al-Bayhaqi and he talks about that. And he has a unique advantage now. What is his advantage? He studies with Imam Malik, he studies the Muatta, he knows those Ahadith, he studies the Usul of the Ahlul Hadith and so on. And then he goes and he studies with Ashab al Rai, yani the people of opinion and deduction, and he looks at their usul and he studies with some of the direct students of Hanifa and so on. And he takes all of that and he puts it together in the first Usul al Fiqh book. And yani not to say that there was no such thing as Usul al Fiqh before that. Obviously, Abu Hanifa and Malik, and before them, uh, other Ali Malik, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, and Nakha'i, and others, uh, they had their Madahib as well. Uh, and also at this time, I'm going to go a little bit outside just the four madahib. You also have in Sham, in Damishq, a great scholar by the name of Al Awza'i. Al Awza'i, uh, a very, very strong Abu Amr, uh, Abdul Rahman Al Awza'i scholar, and also a very early scholar. He was born in 88 Hijri. So he is a contemporary now with Abu Hanifa and Malik and so on. And he died in 157, I believe he is the one that I was thinking of earlier, 157 Hijri, Al-Awza'i. Al-Awza'i is the Imam in Sham. And he was, and he had a very famous madhab. You also have Dawud al-Dahiri, which we'll talk about a little bit as well, inshallah. But you have Al-Awza'i. So he has a lot of the knowledge as well. Shafi'i takes a lot of the knowledge from the students and uh, the madhab of Al-Awza'i as well. Now here, this madhab is developing here, this is developing here, this is developing here. A Shafi'i, Rahmatullah uh, he puts this together. May Allah have mercy on all these great scholars. And he writes the first complete uh, printed, documented work of Usul al Fiqh. It's called Al Risala of Imam Shafi'i. And we still have that. Alhamdulillah, in our Ummah, we still have that. So the Muatta Imam Malik, we still have. The Risala of Al Shafi'i, we also have. And uh, a lot of his fatawa are recorded in a book called Al-Um. Al-Um 
his actual fiqh rulings are recorded as well and authentically attributed to him. Al Risala also authentic attributed to him. The Muatta, no doubt, authentically attributed to Imam Malik. So he is now putting together these schools and their work with now the hadith work that's going on, right? And now he develops what gets to be known as the usul of the Shafi'i madhab. So you have Ashab al Rai now being called the Hanafi madhab. You have the original uh, Ahlul Hadith of Medina being called the Maliki Madhab, but you also have from the Ahlul Hadith the Madhab of a Shafi'i who's bringing together a lot of that knowledge. Now, once again, many people that used to be students of Abu Hanifa uh, or students of Imam Malik that now were now followers of a Shafi'i, it's not like they were fighting each other and things like this. No, when they would see this development, they would they would appreciate it and they would become students of a Shafi'i. Many of them would stick to the Madhab of Abu Hanifa or the Madhab of Imam Malik, but they all worked together. When Abu Hanifa went to Medina, uh, him and Imam Malik, may Allah be pleased with both of them, sat down and discussed Masail and many things they would take each other's opinions and so on. So this development is going on and now you have another great scholar who is a student of the students of Imam Malik, the students of Abu Hanifa, and a direct student of Imam Shafi'i. Also in Baghdad, now you have a great scholar named Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Now, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, what's unique about him? And we'll, we'll get to his uh, life first. So he was born 164 Hijri. I'm going off memory, so if any of these are off for a year or two, uh, don't be upset, inshallah. Two to 241 Hijri. So, uh, 164 to 241 Hijri, Imam Ahmad ibn Hamad, Abu Abdullah, he is, again, in a very unique situation because he is able to benefit directly from the development of Rasul of a Shafi'i. He is able to study with a lot of the students, Imam Abu Hanifa, students, Imam Malik, and he is also able to get a lot of the fiqh of Awza'i. And he is also one of the greatest scholars of Jarh al Ta'adil, in grading of narrators and hadith. He writes the Musnad. The Musnad, um, again, if you get the Mu'asatul uh, Risala print, it's 52 volumes. I mean, that's how big the work is, right? Um, 40,000 unique ahadith and with repetition obviously goes way past that. So he is definitely one of the greatest scholars of hadith. He memorizes a million hadith. What does that mean? Some people get confused. What do you mean? Are there a million hadith? To the scholars of hadith, every time you have a unique chain, that's a separate hadith. Because they don't just memorize the wording of the hadith, they memorize the chains. So when there is a hadith that has 70 chains, to the scholars of hadith that's 70 a hadith because you memorize each chain and you criticize or accredit the chain of narrators not just the wording so putting all the chains together he knows a million a hadith alf alf hadith as has been authentically attributed to him and he writes one of the largest works and he travels he goes to sham he goes to yemen he goes uh, he meets abdul razak sanani and others to study uh, in in yemen he goes to the areas of Persia and Khurasan and Baghdad and all these areas he travels to collect a hadith. And he also studies the usul of Shafi and that of Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik and Awza'i and others. And he develops the last or the best known from the Ahlul Hadith, the Hanbali Madhab, right? And he becomes so well versed in a hadith that his own teacher, a Shafi'i, tells him that you are better versed in hadith than me. So when you know a hadith to be authentic, tell me, correct me, inform me. Uh, and he gets to then really bring together. In his time, now you have all of those scholars of hadith, and we'll talk about the others right now, inshallah, and where they're at and what they're doing, bringing together all those ahadith. Because you had already Ibn Abi Shayba and Abdul Razak Sanani and others that were putting together large collections of hadith, the Musnad being one of the largest, and they're able to verify now, okay, this narration, was it strong? Even though it was well known amongst the people of Misr, was it strong? Was it weak? Who narrated? Where is the chain? Um, this narration was not known in this area, but we found it in this area and so on. To bring all that together and to formulate what is called the Hanbali Madhab. Now, just to understand, there's also in the same area we have a Dawud al Zahiri, and I mean, I'll just put his name here, inshallah. Uh, Dawud al Zahiri. Uh, 
and he is 201 Hijri uh, to 270 Hijri. So he also has a madhab that takes a lot of those narrations and he develops his usul. All of this work is going on in these areas. Now, at that time now, we also have scholars of hadith because fiqh is now dependent on hadith. So you have, for example, in Bukhara, all the way up here, which is in current day Uzbekistan, you have Imam Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari, right? Al Bukhari. Imam al-Bukhari, Muhammad ibn Ismail, Abu Abdullah, his kunya, Imam al-Bukhari. He is unique because his work is not just that he's the earliest work, but his is the most stringently checked. Meaning he goes and he goes to Medina, he goes to Mecca, he goes to all these areas and he finds the ahadith and he looks at the chains and then he researches what the ulema have said about those chains and, and puts together one of the greatest works ever that we know of. He was born in 194 Hijri and he died in 256, uh, I believe, inshallah, Hijri. So, Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari. So, you have him here and you have him as a direct student of Imam Ahmad. He reports hadith in his sahih from Imam Ahmad. So, that means he goes and he presents his collection to Imam Ahmad as well and he benefits from Imam Ahmad. So, now you have a direct relationship. Imam Ahmad, his students, and or, or the students of his students are all of the collectors of the six uh, famous books of hadith. They're not Sahih Sitta, they're Kutub Sitta, but all of those six famous books, and we'll talk about them, all of them can be in the time either directly reporting from Imam Ahmad or from the students of Imam Ahmad, but this is, this is that time period. And why am I uh, emphasizing here? Because that means at this time, all that work is finished. All that collection and put, putting together is done. So you have Imam al-Bukhari here. Then, of course, you have the famous uh, Imam Muslim as well. I mean, not to uh, and not give him his right. He is in Nishapur, which is called Nisapur sometimes, but it's also in its original, and in Arabic we call it uh, Nisabur with the Ba. But in, in Farsi, because this is in the area of uh, current day Iran, it was called Nishapur with the Pa, right? So here in Nishapur, in Persia, you have Imam Muslim. Tayyib, uh, Imam Muslim now, uh, Abu Hussein, Imam Muslim al Hajjaj, great scholar, born 206 Hijri, and he dies in 261 Hijri. Tayyib, so now, he is younger than Imam Bukhari, but the same uh, time period. He also studies from Imam Ahmad and the student Imam Ahmad, and he puts together his Sahih of uh, Imam Muslim, a great work of Hadith. But you also have Imam Ahmad al Nasa'i from Nasa. Al Nasa here, uh, we have, which is actually in current day Turkmenistan. Al Nasa, uh, al Bukhara is in current day Uzbekistan, uh, but this was all Khurasan at the time. So, An-Nasa'i, uh, An-Nasa'i was 214 Hijri to 303 Hijri. So, again, a little bit younger, but from the students, from those who collect Ahadith, and he puts together the Sunan of An-Nasa'i, the Sahih of Imam Muslim, Jami al-Masani the Sahih, also the Jami al-Masani the Sahih Imam al-Bukhari, and also the Sunan of An-Nasa'i. Then you have Abu Dawud in Sistan, Sistan here, which is right on the border of Iran, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. In this area, you have Sistan. Uh, currently, in current day Iran, you have Imam Abu Dawood. Imam Abu Dawood, from the direct students of Imam Ahmad, who left Sistan. I mean, I'm just telling you where they were born, right? But left Sistan, went to Baghdad, spent many, many years with Imam Ahmad, even collected the fiqh of Imam Ahmad in a book called Masal Imam Ahmad of uh, uh, Abu Dawood. So, I mean, a very strong student, Imam Ahmad directly, scholar of hadith. He put together the Sunan Abu Dawood, famous, born 202 Hijri and died in 2... 
75 Hijri. Okay, so here you have Imam Abu Dawood. Uh, and again, uh, his name was Suleiman. Actually, Abu Dawood is his kunya. He collects a hadith as well and he sits with Imam Ahmad, discusses those ahadith, learns from him, reports to him, discusses with him. This again is going on during this time. Um, who do we have left? Imam al Tirmidhi. Let's go to Tirmid. Tirmid, uh, which is in current day Turkmenistan, if I'm not uh, mistaken. It's not in Uzbekistan, it's in Turkmenistan. But Tirm is the area here, and Imam uh, Tirmidhi is here. There. Abu Isa, uh, Imam Tirmidhi, famous, famous scholar. Uh, his actual name is Muhammad. He was born in 209 Hijri. He died in 279 Hijri. Okay. So, again, one of the students who took a hadith from Imam Bukhari, for example, he, when he says, Qala uh, Shaykh in his book, he's talking about Bukhari. When he talks about Abu Abdullah, he's talking about Bukhari. Muhammad ibn Ismail, in a Tirmidhi, he writes in his book, he goes, Qala Muhammad ibn Ismail, he's talking about Bukhari. He takes those ahadith, he takes ahadith from Imam Ahmad students, he travels to Baghdad, he gives those ahadith, that is all put together as well. Um, the last of them, again, we can uh, see, we got everybody else, yeah, which should be Ibn Majah. Ibn Majah is going to be in Qazween which is in current day Iran Ibn Majah he is here Tayyip um, Ibn Majah is born in 209 Hijri I believe and died in 273 which is very close uh, with the Tirmidhi why did I draw all this out in a map format? Because I wanted to show that these great scholars from all these different areas, I mean, it's not just Faras. I mean, you have Khurasan mostly, you have Faras, you have Iraq, you have Sham, you have all these different areas. They traveled and, and met the great companions that were in different areas. And they brought that knowledge then together to centrals of centers of knowledge like Baghdad and so on, which became the center of knowledge, no doubt, during that time. So now you have this development. Did we have Madahib in the time of the Prophet ﷺ? Obviously not. Why? Because you would just go to the Prophet ﷺ. Did we have Madahib during Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, anhum's time? No, because you would go to those Khulafa. But later when you have the Amawiyya and you have the Abbasiyya and you have uh, splits in the Ummah and you don't have a central authority and you have that knowledge spread out and new questions are coming, then there was a need to try to figure it out. So you had the Ahlul Hadith developing their Madhab and Imam Malik and his reliance upon the Amal of people of Medina. No doubt that was a good idea, but as a Shafi'i writes that not all the ulema of hadith were in Medina. Not all of the Sahaba were in Medina. Many of the Sahaba, even uh, yani early on, they left for jihad and they were continuously fighting and traveling and defend and ribad, defending the Muslim lands. And they took knowledge with them. Much of that knowledge was in Kufa and Baghdad and in Sham and so on, all the way in Khurasan and so on. So just to rely on that, it's not necessarily the best way. You can say, okay, that's a great idea, but we also have the scholarly deduction and usul that was developed by the uh, Ashab al-Rai. Then we take that with the usul of the fiqh that's developed by Shafi'i, and then pair that with the usul, all of that work put together with Awza'is and others, and then you develop it with Imam Ahmad being the central point that all of the works of Ahadith kind of work around, meaning that this is where all the ahadith were compiled. So now he can take those usul and he can take those early works and verify them with the authenticity of those narrations, coming up with what is called the Hanbali Madhab. So this is how the Madhahib developed. Should you follow a Madhab? Well, I mean, it depends, right? We cannot say it's obligatory upon every Muslim to follow a madhab. If you say that, we'd say, what is the uh, dalil in the Quran? Some people say, oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as'alu al-ahlu dhikr ask those people who know. Well, that doesn't mean you have to follow a madhab. That just means you need to follow the great scholars, right? What, what madhab did the earlier, the teachers, the tabi'un, that were not sahaba before Abu Hanifa follow and so on. But at the same time, we would say that there is a benefit to these madhab, right? Because they used 
a particular usul to develop students. Now, these areas, like Medina today, if you go, you will see mostly Hanbali Mutun being taught. If you go to Kufa today, most of the people there, that at least the ones that I have met, and Kufa is not a robust city like it used to be, but if you meet the people from that area, either they're Shafi'i or they're Hanbali, you will find both of them. In Baghdad, you will find a lot of Shafi'i, but you will find Hanabala as well. In Sham, you will not find the mother of Awza'i anymore, even though that was the center for it now, you will see most of them being Shafi'i. Egypt went through these Madahib. Khurasan, this was a stronghold for Hanbalis and Shafi'is for a long time. And many of these countries today will follow the Hanafi fiqh because of the Mughal uh, dynasty. You will see the Hanafi fiqh was also predominant in Turkey and things because the Ottomans and so on. So these Madahib are not something out of your DNA. It's not something if you're from this country, you have to follow. If you're from India, you have to be Hanafi. If you're from Afghanistan, if you're from Turkey, you have to be Hanafi. If you're from Sham, you have to be Shafi. If you are from the Jazirat al-Arab, you have to be Hanbali. If you're uh, from Northern Africa, you have to be Maliki. That's not the way it works. And some people say, oh, 70% of the Ummah is Hanafi. These things are ridiculous. First thing, what does it matter how many followers you have? Uh, and secondly, if you look at in Indonesia, Malaysia, many of these big uh, populous Muslim countries, most of Africa, you will find them as Shafi'i, Northern Africa being Maliki and so on. You will find India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, most of them being Hanafi and then also into Central Asia nowadays. And then if you look at Jazirat al-Arab, I mean the, this area here, Qatar and Saudi and stuff, you'll find them as Hanabila. And then you will find in Sham, and then also, as I said, in, in Malaysia, Indonesia, and a lot of the big chunks of the Muslim world in that area being Shafi'i. So everything is, 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 is di divided. I mean, that doesn't really give you which madhab to follow. So should you follow a madhab? Well, it depends. If you're a scholar and if you're able to make ishtihad and if you're able to go directly to the evidences, then obviously not. The, the, the thing that's obligatory upon every Muslim is to follow the Quran and whatever is established from the Mustafa alayhi salatu salam, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But if you're a Aam person, if you're a regular person who doesn't have the ability to go look at the authenticity of a hadith and understand if something is nasikh and mansukh, meaning whether it's abrogated, whether it's early time, whether it's rajih or marjuh, whether it's uh, yani shad or, or munkar or mahfud and all these things, and if you don't even know the terms I'm using, then it's not upon you to just make your own judgment. I think this is a stronger opinion. To me, this makes sense because you don't have that ability. Just like uh, if I'm not a doctor, I shouldn't be out of there writing prescriptions. I shouldn't be out there saying, I think you need to cut off your kidney, you know, whatever, right? Cut it out because uh, I'm not a doctor. I haven't studied. I haven't spent that time. So what should I do? Go to a professional, a medical professional, a doctor, a surgeon, somebody who studied. So you should go to a scholar, not madhab. I mean, don't say I'm Hanafi when you don't know what the Hanafi madhab is. Many times you speak to somebody and say I'm Hanafi, but they couldn't name you five books of Hanafi fiqh. They couldn't name you a single book of usul al-fiqh they could of the Hanafi madhab. They couldn't tell you the difference between the Shafi'i and Maliki and Hanbali and Shafi'i, uh, Hanafi, usul, right? They just took that name. No. Go to a trustworthy scholar that you see as being upon the Quran, upon the Sahih Ahadith, upon the right Aqeedah, giving you uh, evidences for the answers. Take the question to them, get the answer in the light of the Quran and Sahih Ahadith, and follow that. That's your madhab for the Aam person. If you start to study the Sharia, ah, you want to study, you want to develop an understanding. Here, the madhab are a great structure, right? They're not the end goal. They're a structure. Madhab means path, right? It's a path. What's the goal? The sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. You don't want to take a madhab and make it the goal, right? You don't want to be like, I'm Maliki and I'm going to defend the Maliki madhab no matter what. And even if I see Sahih Ahadith, I don't care what Imam Malik himself said. Uh, I just want to defend this like a gang. And that's wrong. That's not the way madhab are supposed to work. It's a madhab. It's a maslak. It's a path. So you can use that path to develop. If you study, for example, the Hanbali Madhab, you can study uh, Dalil al-Talib, you can study Aqsar al-Mukhtasarat, Zaad, and then you can develop past that, right? You can go to al-Mukni'a, you can go to uh, bigger books, and then you can go to al-Kafi, you can go to al-Mughni, you can go to uh, Ghayat al-Muntaha and these bigger al-Ikna'a. So you can use that as a path to develop great. But always keep your loyalty to the Quran or Sunnah. That's what every madhab, that's what every scholar said. So 
many of the opinions of Abu Hanifa were rejected by his own students. Imam Abu Yusuf, Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani. You can look at the books like Al-Hidayah where they reject their own Imam, their own teacher's opinions when they saw the evidences. And many times Abu Hanifa would change his view to their view. And many times they would change their view to his view. And many times they would keep that disagreement. And the Hanafi madhab today is not what Abu Hanifa said, but what Qadi Abu Yusuf said or Muhammad al-Shaybani said. Same with the Shafi and, 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 and Imam Ahmad. Imam Shafi was a student Imam Malik. But when he saw a hadith to be stronger, when he saw an usul to be stronger, he left to opinion Imam Malik and that's why he's called a Shafi'i and that's why he has a madhab. Imam Ahmad was a student of a Shafi'i. But when he saw a hadith to be authentic, when he saw the evidences, he left those opinions. He took the stricter, uh, uh, sticking to the hadith. That is the way you should follow it. All of the a'imma have said to the meaning, Ashal hadith fahuwa madhabi. Whatever is the strongest hadith, that is my madhab. So, if you are a student of knowledge, you can use the path of developing through, right? To me, uh, again, not, I mean, I'm ethnically from uh, the Pashtun areas here, which are majority Hanafi, but I studied the Hanbali Mahtab because I found it to be the closest to strictly following the evidences and so on. As uh, Sheikh Albani says in the Muqaddam of Arwal Ghalil and uh, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, he says as well, and Sheikh Ibn Baz and others. But... If I was in an area that, 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 that was not available to me, then I would study through the other madahib, always keeping my loyalty to the evidences, right? Because that is what's obligatory upon the Muslim. Qala Allah wa qala Rasul alayhi So you develop through the madahib. Then when you reach a level of being a mushtahid, when you have your own ability to make ishtihad, then you may not need the development of the madhab. But don't jump step. Don't be an average Joe, a am person, and then you're like, this guy has a statement, I have a statement, I, I have my own opinion. You don't have the knowledge and credentials to have an opinion. So know your place. If you're a regular person, find a good scholar. Don't worry about Madahib and Hanafi and Shafi. Find a good scholar who's upon the right aqidah, upon the right methodology, who gives you evidences. Follow your scholar. Good. In the light of Quran and Sunnah. If you want to learn through usul and Madahib, you want to be a student of knowledge, you can use the structure of the madahib. It's a wonderful structure. It's been from the time of the Salaf of this Ummah till our time. And the great scholars of this Ummah throughout the Muslim world have used it. Ibn Rajab has works that talks about the benefits of it and so on. Use the structure and get to the goal, which is the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. Always remember that in the end, when you face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will not ask you what madhab you followed. Allah will ask you that this is what was ordered of you. Did you follow it in the Quran, in the Sahih Hadith? That is how we benefit from the madhahib to get to that goal. And as long as we keep that, that our goal, then the paths taken have, is not an issue. But when you make the path the goal, that's when you become a problematic person. When you lose your goal, this is the problem. When you don't have the knowledge and you don't take the path, you're not going to reach the goal. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who use the madahib as it should be to get to the path which is the sunnah, the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa jazakumullahu khairan. Amantu anna al-akhirah la budda yawman atiyah Kullu al-khala'iq hadirah Kullu al-sara'ir badiyah آمنت أن الآخرة لا بد يوما آتية كل الخلائق حاضرة كل السرائر بادية